the three most important things you can do on any project are communicate, communicate, communicate. Of course, one of the biggest things that we run into, and I'm sure everybody's mentioned this one, is the differences in culture. You go from research centers like Langley to space flight centers like uh, Marshall and Johnson and KSC, and then you've also got uh, the folks from Glenn, and then, of course, headquarters, who has a, a completely different perspective than everybody else. You have a team that's spread out like that. It, it has, you know, it's, it's a double-edged sword. You have the good side and the bad side. The good side is you're going to see all kinds of perspective, especially if you've been steeped in one, you're going to get a whole new one. And you're going to go in and go, well, those guys really don't understand. Well, guess what? There's something you don't understand as well. So you get that. You get that diversity of opinion and experience and culture. That part is fantastic. Uh, but it costs you a little bit because you've got to go get on the same page. Um, but when you do that, you're going to have a better product in the end. Now, physically being diverse like that also brings with it its own problems. We had a number of... Um uh, folks that were from various different contractors that had never never worked before. So the biggest lesson is is uh, get them together early, uh, train early, train often, and uh, and learn how they work as a team, both as individuals and then as the companies that they represent. Because in the end, when you're actually trying to execute um, the tasks that we had to go get done and there was problems, it was that relationship that really helped us get through um, get through the hard times in the last couple of weeks when we had issues and had to go work those issues. So it's starting early, get the team down, understand the, um, understand the inner, uh, understand the issues with the team, understand how the team communicates, and and treat it like a team, not as a number of individuals. Badgerless is definitely the way to go. I would say that the avionics IPT and really all of One X benefited from the hardware, software, and experience of the Atlas program. Um, the ELV manufacturers deal with avionics issues and avionics integration all the time, and we learn many lessons um, of what to do, the right things to do, by working with, uh, with Lockheed Martin on this project, and it benefited us greatly. At the same time, ATK built some of the boxes for the avionics um, that were SRB-based, and the experience they brought to the table as a result was invaluable. They really know um, the SRBs and those avionics. So what I would offer is that... Um, our contractors, and specifically the ELV contractors, have a lot to offer NASA in terms of lessons on what to do with avionics and overall vehicle integration. And the fact that 1X was able to benefit from that, I think, was excellent. You know, it was imperative that we made an effort to go establish those relationships. So um, in addition to me doing that, I know the Ground Ops IPT sent uh, folks up to each of the centers to get familiar with the hardware, to again, to build those relationships. So when the hardware got down here, there was already that, that face time between you know two individuals from different centers that they could trust uh, but yeah that, that was imperative for you know I went up to each center introduced myself I, I had to go a few times to a couple different centers um, to, to, to make those relationships and I think that helped us tremendously when the hard work came down here then if there were some trouble on the floor because because even if we sent people up there and I went up there and other people went up there the technicians on you know that are down here that maybe have never met somebody else there there's always going to be a little bit of friction on who's doing what you know so but all that helped so once once the hardware got down here and the fact that we had made some relationships at a little bit higher level we were able to be on the floor and introduce the techs to their techs and their quality and what have you so that was it was critical that those relationships were established communication was key if there was important information someone had that didn't get where it needed to that impacted this driving schedule uh, so some face-to-face -face meetings, travel at least up front to meet the people, established a lot of those relationships where we were able to call up if you had a question or you had some information they needed. Um, to And then being proactive on each uh, team's part was very important. If they saw an issue, uh, they should, and from what I can recall, they did. They, they would call and they would let others know this was an issue they saw and that they thought needed being worked. So we, right off the bat, had identified our interfaces, uh, primarily with upper stage and avionics, and established relationships with them and worked with them regularly, uh, tracking key scheduled dates and when needs were between each of us for the interface requirements. And doing that, again, without having taken the extra effort to go and communicate with these folks on a regular basis uh, would not have been successful if we hadn't done that. 
on the subject of interfaces, something else that avionics did that I think helped us out a lot um, is we had engineers that were part of the avionics IPT that we assigned to go work with the other IPTs that we were interfacing with. And uh, so they acted as a liaison, if you will, to, to bring issues. In fact, many times when we ended up having a discussion at the avionics control board about a certain topic, it's because that liaison recognized something and brought it to my attention that we should have a discussion. And sometimes we were able to resolve things very easily. Other times, like I said, it was beyond, you know, just avionics' authority or the other IPT's authority. And so we bubbled it up to the 1X control board and were able to resolve it there. I think that process worked really well. Um, and so what, what I'm highlighting out there is if you're building an avionics system, especially the way we did it on 1X, which was that avionics was its own standalone element and had to be interfaced with the vehicle, you really need constant communication with the IPTs that you're interfacing with. You need a strong systems engineering organization to help ensure that when the requirements are documented, they really take into account all the perspectives. And as the design is coming together, um, SENI is there to see to it that those requirements are followed. And if you get into a situation where it can't be followed, SENI can foster the discussion about how to work around the problem. And where this really paid in, in dividends, where some people don't necessarily think about this, is software. The software controls you know, how the avionics operate and how the vehicle flight is controlled. Um, there were many things that we did in software in avionics that could have an effect, say, on G and C, or could have an effect on first stage or upper stage, TVC control, whatever. Having those real-time discussions at the avionics control board and having the liaisons to the other IPTs helped us stay conscious of um, did we have all the right software requirements and were they spelled out correctly such that they could be implemented and, and accomplish the design that we all had in mind? And so what I'm offering there is avionics has to be an integrator to get the avionics system incorporated into the vehicle and has to be thinking as an integrator to make sure the software does what it needs to do. Um, and of course, the way to do that is to communicate with the other IPTs and most importantly, communicate with SCNI so that they can integrate across the entire vehicle system. So as we assessed the workforce that we would need at KSC, uh, we were trying to be aware of uh, kind of covering all the bases. Um, so of course, when, when we still had custody of the USS hardware and were completing the manufacturing and the other assembly tasks, such as installation of the, the developmental flight instrumentation, all of the sensors and associated cabling, uh, we had upwards of 20 folks uh, there full time, and in fact, we uh, cut a contract with uh, a condominium in Cocoa Beach so that we could get a better price and try to save some dollars because we knew that you know we were going to need to have 20 people resident there for uh, at least uh, you know two months, and it, it actually went to more like three months by the time uh, we were ready to to, to kind of scale that back after we turned uh, turned over custody. After we turned over custody of the hardware, uh, you know, we had thought initially that we might be able to go down to just basically having one person, you know, resident full time at KSC. And what we found was that given the uh, the number and the intensity of the meetings at kind of the mission management level that were occurring uh, over in Operations Support Building One (OSB1), that we really needed like a, a PM type person like me resident over there, uh, primarily on, on first shift during the, the day shift. Uh, and then we needed somebody like uh, a segment lead engineer, as we called them in our team, who would be resident over uh, in the vehicle assembly building on the, on the shop floor uh, over in, in, uh, in High Bay 4. And uh, then in some cases, when there was more than one shift ops, like two shift ops, uh, we would have two uh, segment lead engineers there to cover the two shifts and in that case then we would have three people there and uh, we found that there was just we really needed that support uh, because you wanted to be close to the hardware when uh, people had questions or when issues cropped up and not have that delay of not being able to get somebody over from OSB1 who might be sitting in a two hour three or four hour board meeting and uh, you know have that impact the schedule. Uh, one of the things I liked about our mission manager was he actually went and lived at other centers. I am a big fan of face-to-face. -face. Telecons are great for saving travel money, but if you really want to know somebody and know what's going on, you sit down with them face-to-face, -face. and that way you're focused with that person, and there's not a whole lot of the other distractions that go on when you're sitting in a telecon or, or even a video con like that.
one thing we found is is, is face-to-face meetings are, are imperative. They're really important to to get um, the team together, to get everybody on the same page. Uh, early on, from 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 an Aries One X mission, it seemed like we were a collection of individual IPTs. And as we had uh, more face-to-face meetings, we could start to to bond together really more as a team on how we're going to um, get this overall mission done and completed and launched uh, as a single team, as opposed to just IPTs from from ground systems providing our piece of it or from the flight hardware providing their piece of it. But how this would all work together and uh, come together to, to, to get the mission off uh, you know, for its launch. Email is the illusion of inclusion. You put people on the email and you tell them this and you just assume because I sent it to them, they actually absorbed what I had to say. But I think anyone that worked in the, in the Aries 1X will say that you know, 200, 250, 300 emails a day were, were norm. You cannot realistically expect people to deal with that kind of um, throughput and do it effectively. At least not me. No, you know, that's just, but I, I believe that I speak for a large number of people that that was kind of a common theme. There's just so much email that it's, it's overwhelming. So the mechanism to get people to talk, really talk to each other, would be important. Get the email. Email's important. It works for certain things, but too much was being done with email, and that was people thought that they were communicating, and that is not an effective way to actually acknowledge that you're being communicated. So, so that's that's a to me a personal takeaway that that you got to have people, and that that takes a step away from my bullpen idea of putting people together. But it is the step in the direction of saying, let's get people to where they're actually communicating and that there is a positive knowledge of communication, which face-to-face is easier to do than on a telecon or a VITS, but that's better than doing it via email. I think the IT solutions were helpful, but that only carries you to a point. So the telecons, the, the emails, the, 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 the uh, VITS and the web access we had were all helpful. However, I think it was really uh, uh, when, when the mission manager brought us together as a team um, at, in, 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 in different areas where we came together, actually traveled, sat down in the same room, talked and walked through the issues. And that way we, you know, we could hear what some of the other IPTs, you know, face to face were really going through what was, what was some of the, 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 their items, issues, struggles. We could put ours out on the table as well. And I thought it really brought us more from, from a collection of IPTs into a, a, a group of IPTs all work in one mission. One of the important ones that we did that uh, project integration had a large role in was communication for our project. We had a very detailed communication strategy that kept our customers as well as our stakeholders informed all the way along. It wasn't something we sprung on people at the last minute. That helped us greatly when we came up to the reviews at the end for us to be able to go through and get buy-in. We got buy-in early. And that was something our mission manager pushed from the start. So we kept every stakeholder involved. We had a newsletter that went out on a weekly basis called The Blast. That was a very good informative tool. It was a top level, but it gave detail that you could understand where the project was and where it was going. You also, We also had weekly briefings to the Constellation Management. So they were kept well informed of every issue and every item that we worked through. So communication was the key. So when we came up on our major reviews, there were very few surprises. It was not like you were over and turning rocks at the meetings. It was they already knew what was what we were doing. They knew our plan forward. So there was a lot of detail there in front of the reviews. So once the reviews actually happened, there was not a you didn't get bogged down in the reviews trying to deal with uh, RFAs and those type of things. We actually worked. The reviews didn't slow us down, and we couldn't on this short of a project. We really had to keep, you know, keep progressing. Otherwise, we wouldn't have flown. One thing we did, we developed a set of posters. We did both movie posters, which were highlighted around the agency for our flight. Sort of, they were in the form of a regular movie poster. You go to a movie that highlighted the date of our launch and the excitement behind our launch coming up. We also did posters that sort of informed people on how our rocket was broken together. 
one of our best ones we did sort of outlined the vehicle. It broke apart the hardware for each one of the IPTs, as well as highlighted the markings of our vehicle. And we called this Aries One Flight Test Vehicle. That was basically what the title of the poster was. And it broke apart each IPT, the hardware that was there. So you could see it both graphically as well as talk to it. So it was a very good communication tool. It was used by the media for various events. It was also used when we were talking to different IPTs and even school. And when you brought in new people to the project, you could actually orient them real easily to where the items were on the rocket because we had them linked showing exactly where it was. That made a big difference as far as bringing people up to speed quickly with what a rocket had.